All right, so thank you for having me. Uh, I'll have to turn around to see the presentation with you, so you'll excuse me if I get away from the mic. So my name is Jean Chaliara. I work uh, in uh, at the Université de Sherbrooke in Sherbrooke, Canada, and so we'll work. Uh, we'll talk today about my work in RNA decortex prediction and how it brought the Perros lab into investigating a new RNA regulation model in the wet lab. So first, we'll have to describe and define what is a G quadruplex. So it starts with a peculiarity of the guanine, which has two uh, sites uh, uh, as a hydrogen donors and two sites as hydrogen acceptors, which causes the, the guanine to actually be able to base pair with itself, which allows the guanine to form G quartets, which is a planar arrangement of four different guanines uh, well, uh, has a cycle as you see here. And each guanine in this structure is actually forming four hydrogen bonds instead of three. So that planar interaction is more stable for each of those guanines. And a G quadruplex is actually the tetrahelix that you'll observe when you have the stacking of, all of those different G quartets upon one another. And within a molecule, you'll have the backbone, well, the, the stems of that tetrahelix shown here and from the top like here, here, and here. And we can cartoon this structure as uh, this cartoon here. We'll use that for the rest of the presentation. So G-force are, uh, I've been shown to uh, fold within a intramolecular uh, RNAs when you have the backbone that can form loops as seen here in blue. And this is really important when you consider the structure has uh, within the, the sequence, so you do have, you do need a high uh, proportion of G within your sequence to have that. And actually, the first person who, uh, the first different experimenters to observe G quads uh, uh, started to uh, postulate this actual motif where you have G tracks of three Gs that are separated with those loops that you see here in blue. The problem is now in the literature, we do have a lot of different examples of a false positive of that motif. So you do have a lot of sequences that do fit this motif that won't fold. And you also have some sequences that will fit the, 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 the motif, but will have some Cs. Uh, well, you basically will have some competition with Watson Crick's different structures that will be favorable, favorable with, uh, well, kinetically. So uh, the flanking sequences around the, the motif is really important to observe the formation of the structure. So my work was to actually work on those uh, structures that will fold, but that do not fit the canonical motif that we had. So I first went through the literature to build a database of all the different sequences that were ever tested as whether or not they would fold. So I do have all the G4 and the non-G-force folding uh, sequences within a database, which is G4 RNA. Now, at first we thought, well, maybe we could have some rules straight away from all of the, all these data, but it turns out to be way more complicated than what we thought. So uh, we actually trained a machine learning algorithm, a, a artificial neural network, out of those sequences. So we have... Uh, about half and half G4 folding and non-G4 folding. Within the G4 folding, a third of them are non-canonical structures. And from the non-G4, we do have 10% of those non-G4 that actually fits the canonical definition of G quad. Uh, so this implementation set, we trained the uh, neural network uh, using five-fold cross-validation, and we did uh, a lot of optimization to finally came out with something that was quite good at as a predictive power. And we do have a very robust uh, predictive power to have different trainings. So uh, I used this uh, G4NN, and I, used, and I wanted to compare it with different other ways to predict G4 that do not rely on the canonical uh, uh, definition of the structure. 
So I used two different scores to compare the CG, and C, uh, the CG on CC score and the G4 Hunter algorithm. So basically, what you have here in, the, uh, in this slide is the G4NN in the x-axis, so the score. You have the G4 Hunter score and the CG on CC score. And I've plotted the sensitivity curve and the specificity curve, well, sorry, the specificity curve going up and the sensitivity curve going down uh, uh, with all the sequences of G4 RNA. So yeah, you'll have the uh, predictive capacity, the predictive power as being the highest point where the two lines will uh, cross. And I validated that using some RNA-seq data that was published of uh, an RT that was blocked by g cortex structures. And what we saw is that the actual, uh, the, 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 all, all of the different scores are quite good to actually predict. But what is very particular with G4NN is that we're very, very skewed to the left when we use the high throughput hits of G4 as, uh, uh, as input. So I've plotted the actual distribution of that to finally understand that, uh, that the G4 RNA data with, uh, with its non-G4 folding sequences is really, really different than the, different, the, the, the two high throughput uh, techniques because you, don't, you only have the actual its of G4 here and the only negatives that you get are actually uh, aeronomics, uh, randomly selected sequences from the RNA. So what we understood is that G4NN is actually really good at discarding any uh, randomly selected transcript. So uh, using now those three different tools, since the three of them are really good, we implemented, it, implemented it, them sorry, <laughs> within a, a software that we call G4RNA Screener, which, which will manage, will take a, a fast as input and will manage like the entire sequences give out the three different scores. So, uh, well, the last few months were, was uh, some work of building interfaces. We do have a command line interface for, uh, we usually use the, that for a high cluster of computer, so high capacity computers, but we do have a GUI, more day-to-day uh, -day use online that you can actually use. So now we, the, my work has buckled the, the loop here, we do have some people now working with the, those predictions into a wet lab and started going into, uh, well, starting to, to publish those data. But the actual experimentation we had from the wet lab along with my G4RNA screener, well, we've come out with a new hypothesis that is G4 structures, we think that we might have different subsets of, uh, of different G4 structures that can be shared in between different RNA molecules that would drive them all together into a common regulatory pathway. So why, uh, well, there's an under underlying premise to that is that we do have some structures that can be subclassified as distinct groups. And uh, so the Rachel in the lab actually uh, is working on that she went through th three different uh, pathways, and what she observed is that from the G4s that she can identify within the genes of those pathways, they do share some features, such as in the wind, uh, wind beta-catenin beta pathway, you, uh, you usually have G4s of four stacked uh, G-quartet. You do have uh, more than the, uh, the minimal uh, amount of G-tracks that you need, in all of those cases, and you do have longer loops in the apoptosis pathway. So I've started to think that maybe the, the, the idea of having a pattern to define GQAD is not bad. The, the real problem is to actually have one pattern that can fit all of them. I think that you can have different patterns that will actually describe the subsets. So what I'm working on right now is to, uh, I'm building right now a a genetic algorithm which will first take as an input an original pattern which will fit a subset of GQAD, a, a subset of transcript that will have a given gene ontology enrichment. What I want is to mutate that pattern which will change the subset of transcript that would correspond to it and uh, see how it will 
change the gene ontology enrichment. So going through that, I should have at the end a lot of different patterns, and within those patterns, I can hope to have common regulatory mechanisms. So that is what I'm working on right now. That will be the uh, last chapter of my thesis. So I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the two labs for which I, I work. This is Michelle. I hope you'll interact with her. She's here at the, at, uh, at the meeting. Uh, Rachel for the wet lab part. Uh, you can see me at poster AFAR. So those are the tools and funding I had. I will be uh, completing my PhD, and I'm looking right now for a postdoc position. So please uh, come uh, at poster AFAR. <laughs> Questions for you, Michelle? <coughs> okay, so I have a question. So about your common patterns, you're, you're using a genetic algorithm, so, so is that because you don't have enough uh, sequences or examples of G-quadruplexes to do uh, a different kind of uh, clustering algorithm, or? Yeah, the, the real issue is that, is that I don't have um, I don't have actually any idea of what kind of uh, ontology term that will come out of that. Because if I try to do the opposite way, I must start with uh, some hypothesis of what, what the G-quad should regulate. And we don't actually have that right now. But I do have a lot of sequences right now. If you do run a gene ontology enrichment right now going through this, you, you'll, ha you'll get some hit about the cancer-related stuff, but I'm not quite sure if it's because there's a bias from what uh, people were searching for at the very first stuff, since the, 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 the stuff I have within the G4RNA database is only what people were looking for in the literature. But so it's, not, it's not easy to define a distance between uh, different instances of the uh, G quadruplexes? So that's why you do genetic algorithm rather than defining distances and then doing clustering? Yeah, I haven't that thought about that. Maybe I should try that first. It's a good idea, actually. Okay. Uh, why did you choose the genetic algorithm to classify your families? Why don't you use a neural network like you did in the first part? Uh, because I, uh, well, since I don't know what the pattern is, I was thinking well, the, the first very uh, naive thought that we had was to generate a very high amount of patterns and just see how it will go but it will uh, it will it will be way too much computing time so that is why uh, I will go with a genetic algorithm with dynamic uh, approach where, where I will just drop off the different mutations that will uh, actually decrease the uh, and the gene ontology enrichment so I will just select the, 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 the going through a pattern and I could actually also get from that some uh, sub-patterns or close enough patterns of the G4 that might be part of a bigger structure. Thanks. So the quadruplex structures can be formed both on RNA level, but uh, the regulator role is usually assumed to be on the DNA level because you can have DNA quadruplexes. Yes. So my question here is how much what you learn about quadruplexes based on RNA structures can be applied to DNA structures and whether it's not risky to, uh, you know, especially in the context of the, uh, the regulatory potential to apply knowledge from RNA to what may be a DNA level regulation. Yeah, there, there's actually more people working on DNA quadruplexes than RNA quadruplexes. And uh, like the, the G4 Hunter uh, algorithm was built for that, actually. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what we do know, how, uh, however, is that uh, there has been some examples, such as the FMRP folding, uh, the FMR1 folding RNA. Uh, we do have a G-Quad that can fold in there. <laughs> when you have like some of the repeats in the uh, in the disease, and that 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 doesn't uh, stop the translating part. So you, you we, from what we know, the DNA is quite okay having those repeats as long as are in small numbers. 
but you will have the formation of the G quad at the RNA level, and that will uh, uh, result in the decrease of the translation of the protein afterwards. So, of course, there's a, a, a very high, uh, in, a, a, a very important uh, DNA aspect of the quadruplexes, but we think that we might have something in RNA that could be targeted at some point, or that can be an, another way of post-transcriptional, because we do have a lot of helicases that, we, that will unfold those G4 within RNA. So the, the point is to target those things. So do you assume that, uh, of course, you know, it's well known that uh, uh, cancer genes are enriched in quadruplexes yes. in their five. So do you assume that DNA or RNA uh, type of regulation? I couldn't say. I, I mean, it's, it's far. It's far to. Uh, we're not there yet. I think to to say that because, as I was saying, I, I do think that there's a small bias right now, because people were looking for cancer-related drugs uh, when they were looking for uh, GQAD. So I guess that there's a bias there, so, and that's it. that is why we do see that cancer enrichment in GQADs. I, I'm not even sure if we will still have this enrichment when we'll have a lot more uh, uh, structures. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's take Jean-Michel again.